Section twenty nine of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section twenty nine. Forty two. Inversion. Five forty one. Again, an immediate inversion, or change to the totally opposite hue, is a very remarkable appearance which sometimes occurs. At present, we are merely enabled to adduce what follows. 452. The mineral chameleon, a name which has been given to an oxide of manganese, may be considered, in its perfectly dry state, as a green powder. If we strew it in water, the green color displays itself very beautifully in the first moment of solution, but it changes presently to the bright red opposite to green, without any apparent intermediate state. 543. The same occurs with a sympathetic ink, which may be considered a reddish liquid, but which, when dried by warmth, appears as a green color on paper. 544. In fact, this phenomena appears to be owing to the conflict between a dry and moist state, as has already been observed, if we are not mistaken, by the chemists. We may look to the improvements of time to point out what may further be deduced from these phenomena, and to show what other facts they may be connected with. 43. Fixation 545. Mutable as we have hitherto found color to be, even as a substance, yet under certain circumstances it may at last be fixed. 546. There are bodies capable of being entirely converted into coloring matter. Here it may be said that the color fixes itself in its own substance, stops at a certain point, and is there defined. Such coloring substances are found throughout nature. The vegetable world affords a great quantity of examples, among which some are particularly distinguished, and may be considered as the representatives of the rest such as, on the active side, matter, on the passive side, indigo. 547. In order to make these materials available in use, it is necessary that the coloring quality in them should be intimately condensed, and the tinging substance refined, practically speaking, to an infinite divisibility. This is accomplished in various ways, and particularly by the well-known means of fermentation and decomposition. 548. These coloring substances now attach themselves again to other bodies. Thus, in the mineral kingdom, they adhere to earths and metallic oxides. They unite in melting with the glasses. And in this case, as the light is transmitted through them, they appear in the greatest beauty, while an eternal duration may be ascribed to them. 549. They fasten on vegetable and animal bodies with more or less power, and retain more or less permanently. Partly owing to their nature, as yellow, for example, is more effervescent than blue, or owing to the nature of the substance on which they appear. They last less in vegetable than in animal substances, and even within this latter kingdom there are again varieties. Hemp or cotton threads, silk or wool, exhibit very different relations to coloring substances. 550. Here comes into the account the important operation of employing mordants, which may be considered as the intermediate agents between the color and the recipient substance. Various works on dyeing speak of this circumstantially. Suffice it to have been alluded to processes by means of which the color retains a permanency only to be destroyed with the substance, and which may even increase in brightness and beauty by use. 44. Intermixture. Real. 551. Every intermixture presupposes a specific state of color, and thus when we speak of intermixture, we here understand it in an atomic sense. We must first have before us certain bodies arrested at any given point of the colorific circle, before we can produce gradations by their union. 552. Yellow, blue, and red may be assumed as pure elementary colors, already existing. From these, violet, orange, and green are the simplest combined results. 553. Some persons have taken much pains to define these intermixtures more accurately, by relations of number, measure, and weight, but nothing very profitable has been thus accomplished. 554. Painting consists, 
strictly speaking, in the intermixture of such specific colouring bodies and their infinite possible combinations, combinations which can only be appreciated by the nicest, most practised eye, and only accomplished under its influence. 555. The intimate combination of these ingredients is effected, in the first instance, through the most perfect comminution of the material by means of grinding, washing, etc., as well as by vehicles or liquid mediums which hold together the pulverized substance, and combined organically, as it were, the inorganic. Such are the oils, resins, etc. 556. If all the colors are mixed together, they retain their general character as charon, and as they are no longer seen next to each other, no completeness, no harmony is experienced. The result is gray, which, like apparent color, always appears somewhat darker than white, and somewhat lighter than black. 557. This gray may be produced in various ways, by mixing yellow and blue to an emerald green, and then adding pure red, till all three neutralize each other, or by placing the primitive and intermediate colors next to each other in certain proportion, and afterwards mixing them. 558. That all the colors mixed together produce white is an absurdity which people have credulously been accustomed to repeat for a century, in opposition to the evidence of their senses. 559. Colors, when mixed together, retain their original darkness. The darker the colors, the darker will be the gray resulting from their union, till at last this gray approaches black. The lighter the colors, the lighter will be the gray, which at last approaches white. 45. Intermixture apparent. 560. The intermixture, which is only apparent, naturally invites our attention in connection with the foregoing. It is, in many respects, important, and indeed, the intermixture which we have distinguished as real might be considered as merely apparent. For the elements of which the combined color consists are only too small to be considered as distinct parts. Yellow and blue powders mingled together appear green to the naked eye, but through a magnifying glass we can still perceive yellow and blue distinct from each other. Thus yellow and blue stripes, seen at a distance, present a green mass. The same observation is applicable with regard to the intermixture of other specific colors. 561. In the description of our apparatus we shall have occasion to mention the wheel, by means of which the apparent intermixture is produced by rapid movement. Various colors are arranged near each other round the edge of a disc which is made to revolve with velocity, and thus, by having several such discs ready, every possible intermixture can be presented to the eye, as well as the mixture of all colors, to gray, darker or lighter, according to the depth of the tints, as above explained. 562. Physiological colors admit, in like manner, of being mixed with others. If, for example, we produce the blue shadow, 65, on a light yellow paper, the surface will appear green. The same happens with regard to the other colors if the necessary preparations are attended to. 563. If, when the eye is impressed with visionary images that last for a while, we look on colored surfaces, an intermixture also takes place. The spectrum is determined to a new color which is composed of the two. 564. Physical colors also admit of combination. Here might be adduced the experiments in which many colored images are seen through the prism, as we have before shown in detail, 258, 284. 565. Those who have prosecuted these inquiries have, however, paid most attention to the appearances which take place when the prismatic colors are thrown on colored surfaces. 566. What is seen under these circumstances is quite simple. In the first place, it must be remembered that the prismatic colors are much more vivid than the colors of the surfaces on which they are thrown. Second, we have to consider that the prismatic colors may be either homogeneous or heterogeneous with the recipient surface. In the former case, the surface deepens and enhances them, and it is itself enhanced in return as a colored stone is displayed by a similarly colored foil. In the opposite case, each vitiates, disturbs, and destroys the other. 567. These experiments may be repeated with colored glasses, by causing the sunlight to shine through them on colored surfaces. In every instance, similar results will appear. 568. The same effect takes place when we look on colored objects through colored glasses, the colors being thus according to the same conditions enhanced, subdued, or neutralized. 569. 
if the prismatic colors are suffered to pass through colored glasses the appearances that take place are perfectly analogous in these cases more or less force more or less light and dark the clearness and cleanness of the glass are all to be allowed for for they produce many delicate varieties of effect these will not escape the notice of every accurate observer who takes sufficient interest in the inquiry to go through the experiments 570 it is scarcely necessary to mention that several colored glasses as well as oiled or transparent papers placed over each other may be made to produce and exhibit every kind of intermixture at pleasure 571 lastly the operation of glazing in painting belongs to this kind of intermixture. By this means a much more refined union may be produced than that arising from the mechanical atomic mixture which is commonly employed. End of section 29. Recording by Todd. Section 30 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Translated by Charles Eastlake Section 30 46. Communication, Actual 572. Having now provided the coloring materials, as before shown, a further question arises how to communicate these to colorless substances. The answer is of the greatest importance from the connection of the object with the ordinary wants of men, with useful purposes, and with commercial and technical interests. 573. Here, again, the dark quality of every color again comes into the account. From a yellow that is very near to white, through orange, and the hue of minimum to pure red and carmine, through all gradations of violet to the deepest blue which is almost identified with black, color still increases in darkness. Blue, once defined, admits of being diluted, made light, united with yellow, and then, as green, it approaches the light side of the scale. But this is by no means according to its own nature. 574. In the physiological colors, we have already seen that they are less than the light, inasmuch as they are a repetition of an impression of light nay at last they leave this impression quite as a dark in physical experiments the employment of semi-transparent mediums the effect of semi-transparent accessory images taught us that in such cases we have to do with a subdued light with a transition to darkness 575 in treating of the chemical origin of pigments we found that the same effect was produced on the very first excitement the yellow tinge which mantles over the steel already darkens the shining surface in changing white lead to massicot, it is evident that the yellow is darker than the white. 576. This process is in the highest degree delicate. The growing intenseness, as it still increases, tinges the substance more and more intimately and powerfully, and thus indicates the extreme fineness and the infinite divisibility of the colored atoms. 577. The colors which approach the dark side, and consequently blue in particular, can be made to approximate to black. In fact, a very perfect Prussian blue, or an indigo, acted on by vitriolic acid, appears almost as a black. 578. A remarkable appearance may here be adverted to. Pigments, in their deepest and most condensed state, especially those produced from the vegetable kingdom, such as the indigo just mentioned, or matter carried to its intensest hue, no longer show their own color. On the contrary, a decided metallic shine is seen on their surface, in which the physiological compensatory color appears. 579. All good indigo exhibits a copper color in its fracture, a circumstance attended to, as a known characteristic, in trade. Again, the indigo, which has been acted on by sulfuric acid, if thickly laid on, or suffered to dry, so that neither white paper nor the porcelain can appear through, exhibits a color approaching to orange. 580. The bright red Spanish rouge, probably prepared from matter, exhibits on its surface a perfectly green metallic shine. If this color, or the blue before mentioned, is washed with a pencil on porcelain or paper, it is seen in its real state owing to the bright ground shining through. 581. Colored liquids appear black when no light is transmitted through them, as we may easily see in cubic tin vessels with glass bottoms. In these, 
every transparent colored infusion will appear black and colorless if we place a black surface under them. 582. If we contrive that the image of a flame be reflected from the bottom, the image will appear colored. If we lift up the vessel, and suffer the transmitted light to fall on white paper under it, the color of the liquid appears on the paper. Every light ground seen through such a colored medium exhibits the color of the medium. 583. Thus, every color, in order to be seen, must have a light within or behind it. Hence the lighter and brighter the grounds are, the more brilliant the colors appear. If we pass lac varnish over a shining white metal surface, as the so-called foils are prepared, the splendor of the color is displayed by this internally reflected light as powerfully as in any prismatic experiment. Nay, the force of the physical colors is owing principally to the circumstance that light is always acting within and behind them. 584. Lichtenberg, who of necessity followed the received theory, owing to the time and circumstances in which he lived, was yet too good an observer and too acute not to explain and classify, after his fashion, what was evident to his senses. He says, in the preface to de Laval, It appears to me also, on other grounds, probable, that our organ, in order to be impressed by a color, must at the same time be impressed by all light, white. 585. To procure white as a ground is the chief business of the dyer. Every color may be easily communicated to colorless earths, especially to alum, but the dyer has especially to do with animal and vegetable products as the ground of his operations. 586. Everything living tends to color, to local, specific color, to effect, to opacity, pervading the minutest atoms. Everything in which life is extinct approximates to white. 494. To the abstract, the general state, to cleanness, to transparency. 587. How this is put in practice in technical operations remains to be adverted to in the chapter on the privation of color. With regard to the communication of color, we have especially to bear in mind that animals and vegetables, in a living state, produce colors, and hence their substances, if deprived of colors, can the more readily resume them. 47. Communication Apparent 588. The communication of colors real as well as apparent, corresponds, as may easily be seen, with their intermixture. We need not, therefore, repeat what has already been sufficiently entered into. 589. Yet we may here point out, more circumstantially, the importance of an apparent communication which takes place by means of reflection. This phenomena is well known, but still it is pregnant with inferences, and is of the greatest importance both to the investigator of nature and to the painter. 590. Let a surface colored with any one of the positive colors be placed in the sun, and let its reflection be thrown on other colorless objects. This reflection is a kind of subdued light, a half-light, a half-shadow, which, in a subdued state, reflects the colors in question. 591. If this reflection acts on light surfaces, it is so far overpowered that we can scarcely perceive the color which accompanies it. But if it acts on shadowed portions, a sort of magical union takes place with the schiera. Shadow is the proper element of color, and in this case a subdued color approaches it, lighting up, tinging, and enlivening it, and thus arises an appearance, as powerful as agreeable, which may render the most pleasing service to the painter who knows how to make use of it. These are the types of the so-called reflexes, which were only noticed late in the history of art, and which have been too seldom employed in their full variety. 592. The schoolmen call these colors colores notionalis and intentionalis, and the history of the doctrine of colors will generally show that the old inquirers already observed the phenomena well enough, and knew how to distinguish them properly, although the whole method of treating such subjects is very different from ours. End of section 30. Recording by Todd. Section 31 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susie. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. 
Translated by Charles Eastlake. Sections 48 and 49. Section 48. Extraction 593. Color may be extracted from substances, whether they possess it naturally or by communication, in various ways. We have thus the power to remove it intentionally for a useful purpose, but, on the other hand, it often flies contrary to our wish. 594. Not only are the elementary earths in their natural state white, but vegetable and animal substances can be reduced to a white state without disturbing their texture. A pure white is very desirable for various uses, as in the instance of our preferring to use linen and cotton stuffs uncolored. In like manner, some silk stuffs, paper, and other substances are the more agreeable the whiter they can be. Again, the chief basis of all dyeing consists in white grounds. For these reasons, manufacturers, aided by accident and contrivance, have devoted themselves assiduously to discover means of extracting color. Infinite experiments have been made in connection with this object, and many important facts have been arrived at. 595. It is in accomplishing this entire extraction of color that the operation of bleaching consists, which is very generally practiced empirically or methodically. We will here shortly state the leading principles. 596. Light is considered as one of the first means of extracting color from substances, and not only the sunlight, but the mere powerless daylight. For as both lights, the direct light of the sun, as well as the derived light of the sky, kindle bologna phosphorus, so both act on colored surfaces. Whether the light attacks the color allied to it, and, as it were, kindles and consumes it, thus reducing the definite quality to a general state, or whether some other operation unknown to us takes place, it is clear that light exercises a great power on colored surfaces and bleaches them more or less. Here, however, the different colors exhibit a different degree of durability. Yellow, especially if prepared from certain materials, is, in this case, the first to fly. 597. Not only light, but air, and especially water, act strongly in destroying color. It has been even asserted that thread, well soaked and spread on the grass at night, bleaches better than that which is exposed after soaking to the sunlight. Thus, in this case, water proves to be a solving and conducting agent, removing the accidental quality, and restoring the substance to a general or colorless state. 598. The extraction of color is also affected by reagents. Spirits of wine has a peculiar tendency to attract the juice which tinges plants, and becomes colored with it often in a very permanent manner. Sulfuric acid is very efficient in removing color, especially from wool and silk, and everyone is acquainted with the use of sulfur vapors in bleaching. 599. The strongest acids have been recommended more recently as more expeditious agents in bleaching. 600. The alkaline reagents produce the same effects by contrary means. Lixiviums alone, oils and fat combined with lixiviums to soap, and so forth. 601. Before we dismiss this subject, we observe that it may be well worth while to make certain delicate experiments as to how far light and air exhibit their action in the removal of color. It might be possible to expose colored substances to the light under glass bells, without air or filled with common or particular kinds of air. The colors might be those of known fugacity 
and it might be observed whether any of the volatilized color attached itself to the glass or was otherwise perceptible as a deposit or precipitate whether again in such a case this appearance would be perfectly like that which had gradually ceased to be visible or whether it had suffered any change skilful experimentalists might devise various contrivances with a view to such researches six hundred two having thus first considered the operations of nature as subservient to our proposes we add a few observations on the modes in which they act against us six hundred three the art of painting is so circumstanced that the most beautiful results of mind and labor are altered and destroyed in various ways by time hence great pains have been always taken to find durable pigments and so to unite them with each other and with their ground that their permanency might be further insured the technical history of the schools of painting affords sufficient information on this point six hundred four we may here too mention a minor art to which in relation to dyeing we are much indebted namely the weaving of tapestry as the manufacturers were enabled to imitate the most delicate shades of pictures and hence often brought the most variously colored materials together it was soon observed that the colors were not all equally durable but that some faded from the tapestry more quickly than others hence the most diligent efforts were made to ensure an equal permanency to all the colors and their gradations this object was especially promoted in france under colbert whose regulations to this effect constitute an epoch in the history of dyeing the gay dye which only aimed at a transient beauty was practised by a particular guild on the other hand great pains were taken to define the technical processes which promised durability and thus after considering the artificial extraction the evanescence and the perishable nature of brilliant appearances of color we are again returned to the desideratum of permanency section forty nine nomenclature six hundred five after what has been adduced respecting the origin the increase and the affinity of colors we may be better enabled to judge what nomenclature would be desirable in future and what might be retained of that hitherto in use six hundred six the nomenclature of colors like all other modes of designation but especially those employed to distinguish the objects of sense proceeded in the first instance from particular to general and from general back again to particular terms the name of the species became a generic name to which the individual was again referred six hundred seven this method might have been followed in consequence of the mutability and uncertainty of ancient modes of expression especially since in the early ages more reliance may be supposed to have been placed on the vivid impressions of sense the qualities of objects were described indistinctly because they were impressed clearly on every imagination six hundred eight the pure chromatic circle was limited it is true but specific as it was it appears to have been applied to innumerable objects while it was circumscribed by qualifying characteristics if we take a glance at the copiousness of the greek and roman terms we shall perceive how mutable the words were and how easily each was adapted to almost every point in the colorific circle note w six hundred nine in modern ages terms for many new gradations were introduced in consequence of the various operations of dyeing even the colors of fashion and their designations represented an endless series of specific hues we shall on occasion employ the chromatic terminology of modern languages 
whence it will appear that the aim has gradually been to introduce more exact definitions and to individualize and arrest a fixed and specific state by language equally distinct. 610. With regard to the German terminology, it has the advantage of possessing four monosyllabic names no longer to be traced to their origin, viz. yellow, gelb, blue, red, green. They represent the most general idea of color to the imagination, without reference to any very specific modification. 611. If we were to add two other qualifying terms to each of these four, as thus red-yellow and yellow-red, red-blue and blue-red, yellow-green and green-yellow, blue-green and green-blue, we should express the gradations of the chromatic circle with sufficient distinctness. And if we were to add the designations of light and dark, and again define in some measure the degree of purity or its opposite by the monosyllables black, white, gray, brown, we should have a tolerably sufficient range of expressions to describe the ordinary appearances presented to us without troubling ourselves whether they were produced dynamically or atomically. 612. The specific and proper terms in use might, however, still be conveniently employed, and we have thus made use of the words orange and violet. We have in like manner employed the word purpur to designate a pure central red, because the secretion of the murex or purpura is to be carried to the highest point of culmination by the action of the sunlight on fine linen saturated with the juice. End of section 31. Section 32 of Theory of Colours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Recording by Chris Gray. Part L. Minerals. 613. The colours of minerals are all of a chemical nature, and thus the modes in which they are produced may be explained in a general way by what has been said on the subject of chemical colours. 614. Among the external characteristics of minerals, the description of their colours occupies the first place, and great pains have been taken, in the spirit of modern times, to define and arrest every such appearance exactly. By this means, however, new difficulties, it appears to us, have been created, which occasion no little inconvenience in practice. 615. It is true, this precision, when we reflect how it arose, carries with it its own excuse. The painter has at all times been privileged in the use of colours. The few specific hues, in themselves, admitted of no change, but from these innumerable gradations, were artificially produced, which imitated the surface of natural objects. It was, therefore, not to be wondered at that these gradations should also be adopted as criterions, and that the artist should be invited to produce tinted patterns with which the objects of nature might be compared, and according to which they were to receive their designations. 616. But, after all, the terminology of colours which has been introduced in mineralogy is open to many objections. The terms, for instance, have not been borrowed from the mineral kingdom, as was possible enough in most cases, but from all kinds of visible objects. Too many specific terms have been adopted, and in seeking to establish new definitions by combining these, the nomenclators have not reflected that they thus altogether efface the image from the imagination, and the idea from the understanding. Lastly, these individual designations of colours, employed to a certain extent as elementary definitions, are not arranged in the best manner as regards their respective derivation from each other. 
Hence, the scholar must learn every single designation and impress an almost lifeless but positive language on his memory. The further consideration of this will be too foreign to our present subject. Footnote 1. These remarks have reference to the German mineralogical terminology, minus T. Pat L. I. Plant 617. The colours of organic bodies in general may be considered as a higher kind of chemical operation, for which reason the ancients employed the word concoction to designate the process. All the elementary colours, as well as the combined and secondary hues, appear on the surface of organic productions, while on the other hand, the interior, if not colourless, appears, strictly speaking, negative when brought to the light. As we propose to communicate our views respecting organic nature, to a certain extent, in another place, we only insert here what has been before connected with the doctrine of colours, while it may serve as an introduction to the further consideration of the views alluded to, and first, of plants. 618 Seeds, bulbs, roots, and what is generally shut out from the light, or immediately surrounded by the earth, appear, for the most part, white. 619. Plants reared from seed, in darkness, are white, or approaching to yellow. Light, on the other hand, in acting on their colours, acts at the same time on their form. 620. Plants which grow in darkness make, it is true, long shoots from joint to joint but the stems between two joints are thus longer than they should be no side stems are produced and the metamorphosis of the plant does not take place 621 light on the other hand places it at once in an active state the plant appears green and the course of the metamorphosis proceeds uninterruptedly to the period of reproduction 622 we know that the leaves of the stem are only preparations and pre-significations of the instruments of florification and fructification, and accordingly we can already see colours in the leaves of the stem which, as it were, announce the flower from afar, as in the case of the amaranthus. 623. There are white flowers whose petals have wrought or refined themselves to the greatest purity. There are coloured ones in which the elementary hues may be said to fluctuate to and fro. There are some which, intending to the higher state, have only partially emancipated themselves from the green of the plant. 624. Flowers of the same genus, and even of the same kind, are found of all colours. Roses, and particularly mallows, for example, vary through a great portion of the calorific circle from white to yellow, then through red-yellow to bright red, and from thence to the darkest hue it can exhibit as it approaches blue. 625. Others already begin from a higher degree in the scale, as, for example, the poppy, which is yellow-red in the first instance, and which afterwards approaches a violet hue. 626. Yet the same colours in species, varieties, and even in families and classes, if not constant, are still predominant, especially the yellow colour. Blue is throughout rarer. 627. A process somewhat similar takes place in the juicy capsule of the fruit, for it increases in colour from the green through the yellowish and yellow up to the highest red, the colour of the rind thus indicating the degree of ripeness. Some are coloured all round, some are only on the sunny side, in which last case the augmentation of the yellow into red the gradations crowding in and upon each other may be very well observed. 628. Many fruits, too, are coloured internally. Pure red juices, especially, are common. 629. The colour which is found superficially in the flower and penetratingly in the fruit spreads itself through all the remaining parts, colouring the roots and the juices of the stem, and this with a very rich and powerful hue. 630. So, again, the colour of the wood passes from yellow through the different degrees of red up to pure red and on to brown. Blue woods are unknown to me, and in this degree of organisation the active side exhibits itself powerfully, although both principles appear balanced in the general green of the plant. 631. 
We have seen above that the germ pushing from the earth is generally white and yellowish, but that by means of the action of light and air it acquires a green colour. The same happens with young leaves of trees, as may be seen, for example, in the birch, the young leaves of which are yellowish, and if boiled, yield a beautiful yellow juice. Afterwards they become greener, while the leaves of other trees become gradually blue-green. 632. Thus a yellow ingredient appears to belong more essentially to leaves than a blue one, for this last vanishes in the autumn, and the yellow of the leaf appears changed to a brown colour. Still more remarkable, however, are the particular cases where leaves in autumn again become pure yellow, and others increase to the brightest red. 633. Other plants, again, may, by artificial treatment, be entirely converted to a colouring matter, which is as fine, active, and infinitely divisible as any other. Indigo and madder, with which so much is affected, are examples. Lichens are also used for dyes. 634. To this fact another stands immediately opposed. We can, namely, extract the colouring parts of plants, and, as it were, exhibit it apart, while the organisation does not on this account appear to suffer at all. The colours of flowers may be extracted by spirits of wine, and tinge it, the petals meanwhile becoming white. 635. There are various modes of acting on flowers and their juices by reagents. This has been done by Boyle and in many experiments. Roses are bleached by sulphur, and may be restored to their first state by other acids. Roses are turned green by the smoke of tobacco. End of section 32. Recording by Chris Gray, CG Systems and Gadgets, and Plants for Pussycats. Section 33 of Theory of Colours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 33. 52. Worms, Insects, Fishes. 636. With regard to creatures belonging to the lower degrees of organisation, we may first observe that worms, which live in the earth and remain in darkness and cold moisture, are imperfectly negatively coloured. Worms bred in warm moisture and darkness are colourless. Light seems expressly necessary to the definite exhibition of colour. 637. Creatures which live in water, which, although a very dense medium, suffers sufficient light to pass through it, appear more or less coloured. Zoophytes, which appear to animate the purest calcareous earth, are mostly white yet we find corals deepened into the most beautiful yellow-red. In other cells of worms, this colour increases nearly to bright red. 638. The shells of the crustaceous tribe are beautifully designed and coloured, yet it is to be remarked that neither land snails nor the shells of crustacea of fresh water are adorned with such bright colours as those of the sea. 639. In examining shells, particularly such as are spiral, we find that a series of animal organs, similar to each other, must have moved increasingly forward, and in turning on an axis produced the shell in a series of chambers, divisions, tubes, and prominences, according to a plan for ever growing larger. We remark, however, that a tinging juice must have accompanied the development of these organs, a juice which marked the surface of the shell, probably through the immediate cooperation of the sea water, with coloured lines, points, spots and shadings. This must have taken place at regular intervals, and thus left the indications of increasing growth lastingly on the exterior. Meanwhile the interior is generally found white or only faintly coloured. 640. That such a juice is to be found in shellfish is besides sufficiently proved by experience, for the creatures furnish it in its liquid and colouring state. The juice of the inkfish is an example, but a much stronger is exhibited in the red juice found in many shellfish, which was so famous in ancient times 
and has been employed with advantage by the moderns. There is, it appears, in the entrails of many of the crustaceous tribe, a certain vessel which is filled with a red juice. This contains a very strong and durable colouring substance, so much so that the entire creature may be crushed and boiled, and yet, out of this broth, a sufficiently strong tinging liquid may be extracted. But the little vessel filled with colour may be separated from the animal, by which means, of course, a concentrated juice is gained. 641. This juice has the property that when exposed to light and air, it appears first yellowish, then greenish. It then passes to blue, then to a violet, gradually growing redder, and lastly, by the action of the sun, and especially if transferred to cambric, it assumes a pure bright red colour. 642. Thus we should here have an augmentation, even to culmination, on the minus side, which we cannot easily meet with in inorganic cases. Indeed, we might almost call this example a passage through the whole scale, and we are persuaded that by due experiments the entire revolution of the circle might really be effected, for there is no doubt that by acids duly employed, the pure red may be pushed beyond the culminating point towards scarlet. 643. This juice appears on the one hand to be connected with the phenomena of reproduction, eggs being found, the embryos of future shellfish, which contain a similar colouring principle. On the other hand, in animals ranking higher in the scale of being, the secretion appears to bear some relation to the development of the blood. The blood exhibits similar properties in regard to colour. In its thinnest state it appears yellow. Thickened, as it is found in the veins, it appears red. While the arterial blood exhibits a brighter red, probably owing to the oxidation which takes place by means of breathing. The venous blood approaches more to violet and by this mutability denotes the tendency to that augmentation and progression which are now familiar to us. 644. Before we quit the element whence we derive the foregoing examples, we may add a few observations on fishes, whose scaly surface is coloured either altogether in stripes or in spots, and still oftener exhibits a certain iridescent appearance indicating the affinity of the scales with the coats of shellfish, mother of pearl, and even the pearl itself. At the same time, it should not be forgotten that warmer climates, the influence of which extends to the watery regions, produce, embellish, and enhance these colours in fishes in a still greater degree. 645. In Otaheite, Forster observed fishes with beautifully iridescent surfaces, and this effect was especially apparent at the moment when the fish died. We may here call to mind the hues of the chameleon and other similar appearances, for when similar facts are presented together, we are better enabled to trace them. 646. Lastly, although not strictly in the same class, the iridescent appearance of certain mollusque may be mentioned, as well as a phosphorescence which in some marine creatures, it is said, becomes iridescent just before it vanishes. 647. We now turn our attention to those creatures which belong to light, air, and dry warmth, and it is here that we first find ourselves in the living region of colours. Here, in exquisitely organised parts, the elementary colours present themselves in their greatest purity and beauty. They indicate, however, that the creatures they adorn are still low in the scale of organisation, precisely because these colours can thus appear, as it were, unwrought. Here, too, heat seems to contribute much to their development. 648. We find insects which may be considered altogether as concentrated colouring matter. Among these, the cochineals especially are celebrated. With regard to these, we observe that their mode of settling on vegetables, and even nestling in them, at the same time produces these excrescences which are so useful as mordants in fixing colours. 649. But the power of colour, accompanied by regular organisation, exhibits itself in the most striking manner in those insects which require a perfect metamorphosis for their development, in scarabae and especially in butterflies. 650. These last, which might be called true productions of light and air, often exhibit the most beautiful colours, 
even in their chrysalis state, indicating the future colours of the butterfly, a consideration which, if pursued further hereafter, must undoubtedly afford a satisfactory insight into many a secret of organised being. 651. If again we examine the wings of the butterfly more accurately, and in its net-like web discover the rudiments of an arm, and observe further the mode in which this, as it were, flattened arm, is covered with tender plumage and constituted an organ of flying, we believe we recognise a law according to which the great variety of tints is regulated. This will be a subject for further investigation hereafter. 652. That, again, heat generally has an influence on the size of the creature, on the accomplishment of the form, and on the greater beauty of the colours, hardly needs to be remarked. 53. Birds. 653. The more we approach the higher organisations, the more it becomes necessary to limit ourselves to a few passing observations, for all the natural conditions of such organised beings are the result of so many premises that, without having at least hinted at these, our remarks would only appear daring and at the same time insufficient. 654. We find in plants that the consummate flower and fruit are, as it were, rooted in the stem, and that they are nourished by more perfect juices than the original roots first afforded. We remark, too, that parasitical plants, which derive their support from organised structures, exhibit themselves especially endowed as to their energies and qualities. We might in some sense compare the feathers of birds with plants of this description. The feathers spring up as a last structural result from the surface of a body which has yet much in reserve for the completion of the external economy, and thus are very richly endowed organs. 655. The quills not only grow proportionally to a considerable size, but are throughout branched, by which means they properly become feathers, and many of these feathered branches are again subdivided, thus again recalling the structure of plants. 656. The feathers are very different in shape and size, but each still remains the same organ, forming and transforming itself according to the constitution of the part of the body from which it springs. 657. With the form, the colour also becomes changed, and a certain law regulates the general order of hues, as well as that particular distribution by which a single feather becomes partly coloured. It is from this that all combination of variegated plumage arises, and whence, at last, the eyes in the peacock's tail are produced. It is a result similar to that which we have already unfolded in treating of the metamorphosis of plants, and which we shall take an early opportunity to prove. 658. Although time and circumstances compel us here to pass by this organic law, yet we are bound to refer to the chemical operations which commonly exhibit themselves in the tinting of feathers in a mode now sufficiently known to us. 659. Plumage is of all colours, yet on the whole yellow deepening to red is commoner than blue. 660. The operation of light on the feathers and their colours is to be remarked in all cases. Thus, for example, the feathers on the breast of certain parrots are strictly yellow. The scale-like anterior portion, which is acted on by the light, is deepened from yellow to red. The breast of such a bird appears bright red, but if we blow into the feathers, the yellow appears. 661. The exposed portion of the feathers is, in all cases, very different from that which, in a quiet state, is covered. It is only the exposed portion, for instance in ravens, which exhibits the iridescent appearance. The covered portion does not, from which indication the feathers of the tail, when ruffled together, may be at once placed in the natural order again. End of section 33section 34 of theory of colors this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer painter 
Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Translated by Charles Eastlake Section 34 Mammalia and Human Beings Paragraph 662 Here the elementary colours begin to leave us altogether. We are arrived at the highest degree of the scale and shall not dwell on its characteristics long. Paragraph 663 an animal of this class is distinguished among the examples of organized being. Everything that exhibits itself about him is living. Of the internal structure we do not speak, but confine ourselves briefly to the surface. The hairs are already distinguished from feathers, inasmuch as they belong more to the skin, inasmuch as they are simple, thread-like, not branched. They are, however, like feathers, shorter longer softer and firmer colourless or coloured and all this in conformity to laws which might be defined paragraph six hundred and sixty four white and black yellow yellow red and brown alternate in various modifications but they never appear in such a state as to remind us of the elementary hues on the contrary they are all broken colours, subdued by organic concoction, and thus denote, more or less, the perfection of life in the being they belong to. Paragraph 665 One of the most important considerations connected with morphology, so far as it relates to surfaces, is this, that even in quadrupeds the spots of the skin have a relation with the parts underneath them, Capriciously as nature here appears, on a hasty examination, to operate, she nevertheless consistently observes a secret law. The development and application of this, it is true, are reserved only for accurate and careful investigation and sincere cooperation. Paragraph 666 If in some animals portions appear variegated with positive colours, this of itself shows how far such creatures are removed from a perfect organization, for, it may be said, the nobler a creature is, the more all the mere material of which he is composed is disguised by being wrought together, the more essentially his surface corresponds with the internal organization, the less can it exhibit the elementary colors. Where all tends to make up a perfect whole, any detached specific developments cannot take place. Paragraph 667 Of man we have little to say, for he is entirely distinct from the general physiological results of which we now treat. So much in this case is in affinity with the internal structure, that the surface can only be sparingly endowed. Paragraph 668 when we consider that brutes are rather encumbered than advantageously provided with intercutaneous muscles, when we see that much that is superfluous tends to the surface, as, for instance, large ears and tails, as well as hair, manes, tufts, we see that nature, in such cases, has much to give away and to lavish. Paragraph 669. On the contrary, the general surface of the human form is smooth and clean, and thus in the most perfect examples the beautiful forms are apparent. For it may be remarked in passing that a superfluity of hair on the chest, arms and lower limbs rather indicates weakness than strength. Poets only have sometimes been induced, probably by the example of the ferine nature, so strong in other respects, to extol similar attributes in their rough heroes. Paragraph 670 But we have here chiefly to speak of colour, and observe that the colour of the human skin, in all its varieties, is never an elementary colour, but presents, by means of organic concoction, a highly complicated result. Footnote this agrees with the general recommendation so often given by high authorities in art to avoid a tinted look in the colour of flesh. The great example of Rubens, whose practice was sometimes an exception to this, 
may however show that no rule of art is to be blindly or exclusively adhered to reynolds nevertheless in the midst of his admiration for this great painter considered the example dangerous and more than once expresses himself to this effect observing on one occasion that rubens like baroccio is sometimes open to the criticism made on an ancient painter namely that his figures look as if they fed on roses lodovica dolce who is supposed to have given the viva voce precepts of titian in his dialogue makes aretino say i would generally banish from my pictures those vermilion cheeks with coral lips for faces thus treated look like masks propertius reproving his cynthia for using cosmetics desires that her complexion might exhibit the simplicity and purity of colour which is seen in the works of apelles those who have written on the practice of painting have always recommended the use of few colours for flesh reynolds and others quote even ancient authorities as recorded by pliny and boschini gives several descriptions of the method of the venetians and particularly of titian to the same effect they used he says earths more than any other colour and at the utmost only added a little vermilion minium and lake abhorring as a pestilence biadetti gialli santi smaltini verdi azuri giallolini elsewhere he says earth should be used rather than other colours after repeating the above prohibited list he adds i speak of the imitation of flesh for in other things every colour is good again our great titian used to say that he who wishes to be a painter should be acquainted with three colours white black and red assuming this account to be a little exaggerated it is still to be observed that the monotony to which the use of few colours would seem to tend is prevented by the nature of the venetian process which was sufficiently conformable to goethe's doctrine the gradations being multiplied and the effect of the colours heightened by using them as semi-opaque mediums immediately after the passage last quoted we read he also gave this true precept that to produce a lively colouring in flesh it is not possible to finish at once as these particulars may not be known to all we add some further abridged extracts explaining the order and methods of these different operations the venetian painters says this writer after having drawn in their subject go in the masses with very solid colour without making use of nature or statues their great object in this stage of their work was to distinguish the advancing and retiring portions that the figures might be relieved by means of chiaroscuro one of the most important departments of colour and form and indeed of invention having decided on their scheme of effect when this preparation was dry they consulted nature and the antique not servilely but with the aid of a few lines on paper quattro segni in carta they corrected their figures without any other model then returning to their brushes they began to paint smartly on this preparation producing the colour of flesh the passage before quoted follows stating that they used earths chiefly that they carefully avoided certain colours and likewise varnishes and whatever produces a shining surface when this second painting was dry they proceeded to scumble over this or that figure with a low tint to make the one next to it come forward giving another at the same time additional light for example on a head a hand or a foot thus detaching them so to speak from the canvas tintoret's prigione di santa rocco is here quoted by thus still multiplying these well understood retouchings where required on the dry surface a secco they reduced the whole to harmony in this operation they took care not to cover entire figures 
but rather went on gemming them, Gioli Landole, with vigorous touches. In the shadows, too, they infused vigour frequently by glazing with asphaltum, always leaving great masses in middle tint, with many darks, in addition to the partial glazings and few lights. The introduction to the subject of Venetian colouring, in the poem by the same author, is also worth transcribing, but as the style is quaint and very concise, a translation is necessarily a paraphrase. The art of colouring has the imitation of qualities for its object. Not all qualities, but those secondary ones which are appreciable by the sense of sight. The eye especially sees colours. The imitation of nature in painting is therefore justly called colouring, but the painter arrives at his end by indirect means. He gives the varieties of tone in masses, he smartly impinges lights, he clothes his preparation with more delicate local hues. He unites, he glazes. Thus everything depends on the method, on the process. For if we look at colour abstractedly, the most positive may be called the most beautiful. But if we keep the end of imitation in view, this shallow conclusion falls to the ground. The refined Venetian manner is very different from mere direct, sedulous imitation. Every one who has a good eye may arrive at such results, but to attain the manner of Paolo, of Bassan, of Palma, Tintoret, or Titian, is a very different undertaking. The effects of semi-transparent mediums in some natural productions seem alluded to in the following passage. Nature sometimes accidentally imitates figures in stones and other substances, and although they are necessarily incomplete in form, yet the principle of effect, or depth, resembles the Venetian practice. In a passage that follows, there appears to be an allusion to the production of the atmospheric colours by semi-transparent mediums. End of footnote paragraph 671 that the colour of the skin and hair has relation with the differences of character is beyond question and we are led to conjecture that the circumstance of one or other organic system predominating produces the varieties we see a similar hypothesis may be applied to nations in which case it might perhaps be observed that certain colours correspond with certain conformations which has always been observed of the negro physiognomy. Paragraph 672 Lastly, we might here consider the problematical question whether all human forms and hues are not equally beautiful, and whether custom and self-conceit are not the causes why one is preferred to another. We venture, however, after what has been adduced, to assert that the white man, that is, he whose surface varies from white to reddish, yellowish, brownish, in short, whose surface appears most neutral in hue and least inclines to any particular or positive colour, is the most beautiful. On the same principle, a similar point of perfection in human conformation may be defined hereafter when the question relates to form. We do not imagine that this long-disputed question is to be thus once for all settled, for there are persons enough who have reason to leave this significancy of the exterior in doubt. But we thus express a conclusion, derived from observation and reflection, such as might suggest itself to a mind aiming at a satisfactory decision. We subjoin a few observations connected with the elementary chemical doctrine of colours. Footnote. The author's conclusion here is unsatisfactory, for the colour of the black races may be considered at least quite as negative as that of Europeans. It would be safer to say that the white skin is more beautiful than the black, because it is more capable of indications of life and indications of emotion. A degree of light which would fail to exhibit the finer varieties of form on a dark surface would be sufficient to display them on a light one and the delicate mantlings of colour, 
whether the result of action or emotion, are more perceptible for the same reason. End of footnote. End of section 34. Section 35 of Theory of Colours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Part LV. Physical and Chemical Effects of the Transmission of Light Through Coloured Mediums. 673. The physical and chemical effects of colourless light are known, so that it is unnecessary here to describe them at length. Colourless light exhibits itself under various conditions as exciting warmth, as imparting a luminous quality to certain bodies, as promoting oxidation and deoxidation. In the modes and degrees of these effects, many varieties take place, but no difference is found indicating a principle of contrast such as we find in the transmission of coloured light. We proceed briefly to advert to this. 674. Let the temperature of a dark room be observed by means of a very sensible air thermometer. If the bulb is then brought to the direct sunlight, as it shines into the room, nothing is more natural than that the fluid should indicate a much higher degree of warmth. If upon this we interpose coloured glasses, it follows again quite naturally that the degree of warmth must be lowered, first, because the operation of the direct light is already somewhat impeded by the glass, and again, more especially, because a coloured glass, as a dark medium, admits less light through it. 675. But here a difference in the excitation of warmth exhibits itself to the attentive observer, according to the colour of the glass. The yellow and the yellow-red glasses produce a higher temperature than the blue and blue-red, the difference being considerable. 676. This experiment may be made with the prismatic spectrum. The temperature of the room being first remarked on the thermometer, the blue-coloured light is made to fall on the bulb, when a somewhat higher degree of warmth is exhibited, which still increases as the other colours are gradually brought to act on the mercury. If the experiment is made with the water prism, so that the white light can be retained in the centre, this, refracted indeed, but not yet coloured light, is the warmest, and the other colours stand in relation to each other as before. 677. As we here merely describe, without undertaking to deduce or explain this phenomenon, we only remark in passing that the pure light is by no means abruptly and entirely at an end with the red division in the spectrum, but that a refracted light is still to be observed deviating from its course and, as it were, insinuating itself beyond the prismatic image, so that on closer examination it will hardly be found necessary to take refuge in invisible rays and their refraction. 678. The communication of light by means of coloured mediums exhibits the same difference. The light communicates itself to Bologna phosphorus through blue and violet glasses, but by no means through yellow and yellow-red glasses. It has been even remarked that the phosphory which have been rendered luminous under violet and blue glasses becomes sooner extinguished when afterwards placed under yellow and yellow-red glasses than those which have been suffered to remain in a dark room without any further influence. 679. These experiments, like the foregoing, may also be made by means of the prismatic spectrum when the same results take place. 680. To ascertain the effect of coloured light on oxidation and deoxidation, the following means may be employed. Let moist, perfectly white muriate of silver be spread on a strip of paper. Place it in the light so that it may become to a certain degree grey and then cut it in three portions. Of these, one may be preserved in a book as a specimen of this state, let another be placed under a yellow-red and the third under a blue-red glass. The last will become a darker grey and exhibit a deoxidation. The other, under the yellow-red glass, will, on the contrary, become a lighter grey 
and thus approach nearer to the original state of more perfect oxidation. The change in both may be ascertained by a comparison with the unaltered specimen. 681. An excellent apparatus has been contrived to perform these experiments with the prismatic image. The results are analogous to those already mentioned, and we shall hereafter give the particulars, making use of the labours of an accurate observer, who has been for some time carefully prosecuting these experiments. Translator's footnote, see back. Part LVI, Chemical Effect in Dioptrical Achromatism. 682. We first invite our readers to turn to what has been before observed on this subject, to avoid unnecessary repetition here. 683. We can thus give a glass the property of producing much wider coloured edges without refracting more strongly than before, that is, without displacing the object much, much more perceptibly. 684. This property is communicated to the glass by means of metallic oxides. Minium, melted and thoroughly united with a pure glass, produces this effect, and thus flint glass is prepared with oxide of lead. Experiments of this kind have been carried farther, and the so-called butter of antimony, which, according to a new preparation, may be exhibited as a pure fluid, has been made use of in hollow lenses and prisms, producing a very strong appearance of colour with a very moderate refraction, and presenting the effect which we have called hyperchromatism in a very vivid manner. 685. In common glass, the alkaline nature obviously preponderates, since it is chiefly composed of sand and alkaline salts, hence a series of experiments exhibiting the relation of perfectly alkaline fluids to perfect acids might lead to useful results. 686. For, could the maximum and minimum be found, it would be a question whether a refracting medium could not be discovered, in which the increasing and diminishing appearance of colour, an effect almost independent of refraction, could not be done away with altogether, while the displacement of the object would be unaltered. 687. How desirable, therefore, it would be with regard to this last point, as well as for the elucidation of the whole of this third division of our work, and, indeed, for the elucidation of the doctrine of colours generally, that those who are occupied in chemical researches, with new views ever opening to them, should take this subject in hand, pursuing into more delicate combinations what we have only roughly hinted at, and prosecuting their inquiries with reference to science as a whole. End of section 35 Recording by Chris Gray, CG Systems and Gadgets, and Plants for Pussycats. Section 36 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Gitt. Translated by Charles Eastlake, 1810. General Characteristics, 688. We have hitherto, in a mere manner forcibly, kept phenomena sender which partly from their nature, partly in accordance with our mental habits, have, as it were, constantly sought to be reunited. We have exhibited them in three divisions. We have considered colors, first as transient, the result of an action and reaction in the eye itself, next as passing effects of colorless, light-transmitting, transparent and opaque mediums on light, especially on the luminous image. Lastly, we arrived at the point where we could securely pronounce them as permanent and actually inheriting in bodies. 689. 
In following this order, we have as far as possible endeavoured to define, to separate and to class the appearances. But now that we need no longer be apprehensive of mixing and confounding them, we may proceed, first, to state the general nature of these appearances considered abstractedly, as an independent circle of facts, and in the next place, to show how this particular circle is connected with other classes of analogous phenomena in nature. The facility with which color appears. We have observed that color, under many conditions, appears very easily. The susceptibility of this eye with regard to light, the constant reaction of the retina against it, produce instantaneously a slight iridescence. Every subdued light may be considered as colored, nay, we ought to call any light colored, inasmuch as it is seen. Colorless light, colorless surfaces are in some sort abstract ideas. In actual experience we can hardly be said to be aware of them. 691. If light impinges on a colorless body, is reflected from it, or passes through it, color immediately appears. But it is necessary here to remember what has been so often urged by us, namely that the leading conditions of refraction, reflection, and so on, are not of themselves sufficient to produce the appearance. Sometimes, it is true, light acts as these merely as light, but oftener as a defined, circumscribed appearance, as a luminous image. The semi-opacity of the median is often a necessary condition, while half the double shadows are required for many colored appearances. In all cases, however, Color appears instantaneously. We find, again, that by means of pressure, breathing heat, by various kinds of motion and alteration on smooth, clean surfaces, as well as on colorless fluids, color is immediately produced. 692. The slightest change has only to take place to component parts of bodies, whether by immixture with other particles or to such effects, and color either makes its appearance or becomes changed. To for the force of color, 693. The physical colors, and especially those of the prism, were formerly called colores in fetici, on account of their extraordinary beauty and force. Strictly speaking, however, a high degree of effect may be ascribed to all appearances of color, assuming that they are exhibited under the purest and most perfect conditions. 694. The dark nature of color, its full rich quality, and what produces the grave and at the same time fascinating impression we sometimes experience, and as color is to be considered a condition of light, so it cannot dispense with light as the cooperating cause of its appearance, as its basis or ground, as a power thus displaying and manifesting color. The definite nature of color. 695. The existence and the relatively definite character of color are one and the same thing. Light displays itself in the face of nature, and it were, with a general indifference, informing us to surrounding objects, perhaps devoid of interest or importance. But color is at all times a specific characteristic and significant. 696. Considered in a general point of view, color is determined towards one of the two sides, 
It thus presents a contrast which we call polarity, and which we may fitly designate by the expressions plus and minus. Plus yellow, minus blue. Plus action, minus negation. Plus light, minus shadow. Plus brightness, minus darkness. Plus force, minus weakness. Plus warmth, minus coldness. Plus proximity, minus distance. Plus repulsion, minus attraction. Plus affinity with acids, minus affinity with alkalis. Combination of the two principles, 697. If these specific contrasted principles are combined, the respective qualities do not, therefore, destroy each other. For it, in this intermixture, the ingredients are so perfectly balanced that neither is to be distinctly recognized, the union again acquires a specific character. It appears as a quality by itself in which we no longer think of a combination. The union we call green. 698. Thus, if two opposite phenomena springing from the same source do not destroy each other when combined, but in their union present a third appreciable and pleasing appearance, this result at once indicates their harmonious relation. The more perfect result yet remains to be adverted to. Argumentation to Red 699 Blue and yellow do not admit of increased intensity without presently exhibiting a new appearance in addition to their own. Each color, in its lightest state, is a dark. If condensed, it must become darker, but this effect no sooner takes place than the hue assumes an appearance which we designated by the word reddish. 700. This appearance still increases so that when the highest degree of intensity is attained, it predominates over the original hue. A powerful impression of light leaves the sensation of red on the retina. In the prismatic yellow-red which springs directly from the yellow, we hardly recognize the yellow. 701. Thus deepening takes place again by means of colorless semi-transparent mediums, and have here we see the effect in its utmost purity and extent. Transparent fluids, colored with any given hues in a series of glass vessels, exhibit it very strikingly. The augmentation is unremittingly repaid and constant. It is universal and obtains in physiological as well as physical and chemical colors. Junction of two augmented extremes, 702. As the extremes of the simple contrasts produce a beautiful and agreeable appearance by their union, so the deepened extremes on being united will present a still more fascinating color. Indeed, it might naturally be expected that we should here find the acme of the whole phenomenon. Completeness, the result of variety, 703. And such is the fact, for pure red appears, a color to which, from its excellence, we have appropriated the term purple. 704. There are various modes in which pure red may appear. 
by bringing together the violet edge and the yellow-red border in prismatic experiments, by continued augmentation and chemical operations, and by the organic contrast in physiological effects. 705. As a pigment, it cannot be produced by intermixture or union, but only by arresting the hue in substances chemically acted on, at a high culminating point. Hence, the painter is justified in assuming that there are three primitive colors from which he combines all the others. The natural philosopher, on the other hand, assumes only two elementary colors from which he, in like manner, develops the co and combines the rest. Completeness, the result of variety in color. 706. The various appearances of color arrested in their different degrees and seen in juxtaposition produce a whole. This totally is harmony to eye. 707. The chromatic circle has been gradually presented to us. The various relations of its progression are apparent to us. Two pure original principles in contrast are the foundation of the whole. An augmentation manifests itself by means of which both approach a third state. Hence, there exists on both sides a lowest and highest, a simple and most qualified state. Again, two combinations present themselves. First, that of the simple primitive contrasts, then that of the deepened contrasts. Harmony of the complete state, 708. The whole ingredients of the chromatic scale, seen in juxtaposition, produce an harmonious impression on the eye. The difference between the physical contrast and the harmonious opposition in all its extent should not be overlooked. The first resides in the pure restricted original dualism considered in its antagonizing elements. The other results from the fully developed effects of the complete state. 709 Every single opposition, in order to be harmonious, must comprehend the whole. The physiological experiments are sufficiently convincing on this point. A development of all the possible contrasts of the chromatic scale will be shortly given. Facility with which color may be made to tend either to the plus or minus side. 710. We have already had occasion to take notice of the mutability of color in considering its so-called augmentation and progressive variations round the whole circle. But the hues even pass and repass from one side to the other, rapidly and of necessity. 711. Physiological colors are different in appearance as they happen to fall on a dark or on a light ground. In physical colors, the combination of the objective and subjective experiments is very remarkable. The epoptical colors, it appears, are contrasted according to the light shines through or upon them. To what extent the chemical colors may be changed by fire and alkalis has been sufficiently shown in its proper place. Evanescence of Color, 712 All that has been adverted to as subsequent to the rapid excitation and definition of color in mixture, augmentation, combination, separation, not forgetting the law of compensatory harmony, all takes place with the greatest rapid and facility, 
but with equal quickness color again altogether disappears. 713. The physiological appearances are in no wise to be arrested. The physical lasts only as long as the external condition lasts. Even the chemical colors have great mutability. They may be made to pass and repass from one side to the other by means of opposite reagents and may even be enlated altogether. Permanence of color. The chemical colors afford evidence of very great duration. Colors fixed in a glass by fusion and by nature in gems defy all time and reaction. 715. The art of dyeing again fixes color very powerfully. The hues of pigments, which might otherwise be easily rendered mutable by reagents, may be communicated to substances in the greatest permanency by means of mordants. End of section 4 Recording by Brianna